Welcome to Madlik. My name is Jeffrey Stern, and at Madlik we light a spark or shed some light on a Jewish text or tradition. Along with Rabbi Adam Mintz, we host Madlik Disruptive Toe on Clubhouse every Thursday and share it as the Madlik podcast on your favorite platform. This week's Parsha is Shoftim. As the state of Israel is polarized by the role and authority of the Supreme Court, we read the biblical injunction to provide judges and pursue justice. We will study the primary sources and we wonder why both sides are claiming the mantle of democracy, but no one in the Jewish state is discussing Judaism. So join us for Courting Justice. Well, welcome back, Rabbi. Uh, we're doing it early today because you're off for the West Coast. The traveling rabbi lives up to his name. How are you today? I'm great. Um, how are you? Um, hope everybody here had a, had a good week. And we're looking forward to talking about justice. Show Tim to show Trim. So, you know, a week or two ago, if you recall, I uh, quoted a Facebook uh, post from my uh, a friend, uh, Joe Schwartz, and he was commenting that not many signs amongst the demonstrators had Jewish references. There was a lot of, of references to Demokratia and, and things like that, but not that much that is Jewish. So I'm kind of turning the tables on that uh, observation because I've heard it a lot. And I'd like to say that that those who you'd really expect to have Jewish references, the right, who are made up of the Haredim, who are made up of religious Zionists, they're basically claiming that they have the right to do it because they won an election, and that's how democracy works. They, too, do not reference Judaism. So I think it's about time we have Parshat Shoftim, which, as I said in the introduction, is all about about appointing judges and doing justice, that we go to the sources and find some answers and also ask some questions like, why is no one discussing Parshat Shoftim and our Torah and its sense of what we need in a Supreme Court? Why is this whole Jewish state acting as if there are a bunch of Greeks in Athens? Can you believe it, Rabbi? No, it's, you're, you're 100% right, and let's, um, let's, let's dive right into it. So we're in Deuteronomy 16, 18, and it says, You shall appoint magistrates and officials for your tribes in all the settlements. So right here it says, Shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha. This is a positive commandment, just as every Jewish community is defined by a mikveh, by a Beit Knesset, a house of study, a gamach. It is also determined and defined by a bet-din, by starting a court, by having someone to adjudicate. So it, it contains both the positive commandment and the fact that it is such an integral part of Jewish life that it has to be in every settlement, wherever you are. And then it says in 19, you shall not judge unfairly, you shall show no partiality, you shall not take bribes, for bribes blind the eyes of the discerning and upset the plea of the just. So rather than focus on what the justices are supposed to do, uh, what legal codes they're supposed to reference, the argument here is make sure that they are fair, that they see things with equanimity. And then it says the most powerful uh, phrase, one of the most powerful phrases in the whole Torah, justice, justice shall you pursue. Tzedek, tzedek, Tirdof. Tirdof is almost, it is, is, it's as close to something that is a absolute flaming passion. A rodef is someone who's chasing somebody. That's how you have to chase justice, and that's been ingrained in the DNA of the Jewish people, that you may thrive and occupy the land that your God is giving you. And again, too, it is in this general uh, sense of Deuteronomy that this is a contingent agency. Based on this, you will be able to remain in the land. In those three verses, Rabbi, it, it really says it all, doesn't it? It sure does. These are, I mean, arguably the most powerful verses in the entire Torah. Um, and okay, let's go. And of course, the word, you know, you talk about the word tirdof and, you know, the passion in the word tirdof. What about the fact that the word tzedek is repeated twice? 
tzedek, tzedek. You never have that in the Torah. Right, but here it says it twice. Okay, so uh, I, I I looked at a lot of sources. I just want to give the kind of the general view. The Tor Choshen Mishpat. This is the codification of uh, Jewish laws, and he quotes a less common Al Shloshad Devarim on three things the world rests. Uh, and his version is it is Al Hadin Va'al Emet Al Hashalom on judgment, on truth, and on peace, and. And uh, basically, he says that um, the world was uh, created, but it is sustained uh, because there are judges that judge between people. And that is why the world continues. For if it were not for the law, the more powerful would conquer. Um, And he also said, because if you recall, it says peace, one should pray for the peace of the government. Bishlomo shel malchut. So I would um, hazard to guess that when um, I would ask people why are we not discussing um, the, the the parsha when it comes to ju- judicial reform, my guess is a lot of people would say, well, the Supreme Court isn't really a bet din. A bet din has to be a religious institution. Uh, the Supreme Court is part of the state of Israel. Um, it's uh, part of um, Alien law, uh, it doesn't uh, really confer on Jewish biblical law and all that. So it's a tool that we have to play with. And I will argue that in all of the verses that we are discussing, the emphasis not on the code of law that these judges follow, because what they're doing is they're creating peace. They're they're almost, you could almost say in many contracts today, rather than go to the uh, law of New York, it says we will agree to uh, people that mediation to mediation. We're really looking at creating judges who have the utmost integrity that will provide mediation and make shalom. And that the fact that it says b'shlomo shel malchut when it's referring to the land of Israel, again, it always assumed there was a government, a malchut, and it always assumed that if you don't have judges that can help guide people and do the right thing, um, then you cannot have a sustainable society. But it, to me, we're not talking about a bet din in your local shtetl. We're talking about judicial courts that enable people to resolve their uh, conflicts and questions. Am I right? I think you're 100% right. I mean, I think that's an important distinction to be made. So, right if you get to the, the commentaries and some of the stuff, they already say, for instance, the Kli Yakar, when it says uh, judges and officers, um, is that you have to have authority to appoint judges, that they shall appoint them, and that the judges shall no, show no favoritism. This is the meaning of the phrase, appoint for yourself, as if to say over yourself. It follows a Afa Teori, a Kalva Homer, that the judges should judge all all the people justly. It's kind of like love your neighbor at yourself. You should appoint a judge as though that judge was going to appoint you. But again, the key emphasis on all of this has nothing to do with the legal codes that these judges are going to refer to. It has to do with the integrity of the judges. It has to do with the integrity of the process of appointing judges. In Leviticus 24, 22, it says, you shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike, for I am your God. Mishpat echad lachem. Again, it's not referring to any particular code of law. It's talking about fairness uh, amongst all your citizens. It's just so obvious to me, and I'm not, I'm not westernizing, and I don't think I'm projecting onto this, to the verses. No, I mean that's that is an interesting verse. Mishpat echad yelachem kager ke You know how many times I think the Torah twenty six times tells you that you have to be nice to the ger to the stranger. You know we use the word ger as convert, as we know, but that's not what the Torah means by ger. Ger means the you know the person who's kind of marginal to society, who's not really part of society. And the Torah here says mishpat echad yelachem kager ke Yehiyah means that you have to treat the person on the margins the way you treat the citizen. That's a very striking verse. 
And, and again, it, it's not part of the current discussion. But here's the kicker that's not part of the current discussion. In Exodus 23, 2, it says, You shall neither side with the multitude to do wrong. Achrei rabim l'ra'ot. It says, don't go after the many to do bad. Uh, again, I'm not saying that this is what it appears to be on face value, meaning to say that it's saying particularly that even if you have a democratically elected government, they can't override certain standards. That you have to drill down to, and we're going to discuss, hopefully we'll have time to look at uh, the Supreme Court Justice um, uh, Menachem Elon that I mentioned, but at least it should be part of the discussion. Um, why would you have the elected government today, which is not only the most radical, but the most religious, and all it refers to is we won, we won the popular vote, and not refer or even address that you don't go lahatot. It's it's total to me. It's total hypocrisy, and more to say, it's missing a moment. We could be having an amazing learning moment, a learning discussion for all of us to determine what is a democratic Jewish state, and we're not. I think that's right. It's by the way, lo achare rabim liraot. Don't follow the the majority, the mighty. When it comes to doing wrong, that's a very, very interesting verse because usually we follow the majority, but don't, don't let the majority sway us to do bad. There's an ultimate morality, an ultimate right that you have to do even if you are in the minority. It's also an amazing verse. So that that's going to take us uh, to the Supreme Court Justice that I want to dedicate a little bit of time to today. So his name was Menachem Elon, and um, he I actually know him because on my bookcase I have a two volume set called Mishpat Ivri, uh, Jewish Law. Um, he was a totally not only committed Orthodox Jew but an absolutely erudite uh, Orthodox Jew. He had smicha, um, and uh, he was on the Supreme Court and. And he wrote a fascinating article, which I um, uh, have quoted extensively in the notes. And he really addresses the issue of what exactly is a Jewish democratic state with regard to the um, con- to 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 to, to uh, law and and the Supreme Court. So he talks about the principle of the majority rule, and he actually says that the verse that we just described is in interpreted and probably affects more a case of a court case, maybe even a capital uh, court case, where uh, you can't just have a simple majority, uh, where there is a, a question of you might be doing the wrong thing. But he, So he says that uh, the question of majority rule is not found in the teachings uh, of the Talmudic sages. He says the connection um, uh, for democracy arose with the rise of the Kihila in the 10th century century. Um, and uh, he explains that prior to that, there were kings. Later, there was the Nasi. There was the Reish Galuta, the Exiliarch uh, in Babylonia. It wasn't till the 10th century and the emancipation that Jewish communities, like other closely knit communities, were given permission to set up their own courts and, ba- courts and basically to adjudicate themselves. The halachic authorities of the time debated the question of majority rule in community affairs. One great scholar, Rabbeinu Tam, held that the majority could not bind the minority. This was, in fact, the view accepted by European corporate law in the Middle Ages. Um, um, so here you have Menachem Ilon, who not only knows Jewish law to the level of the Rabbeinu Tam and the Tosfot and all that, but he also knew a European law. He says, however, the view of most halachic authorities was that the biblical command, follow the majority, also applied to public affairs, and this view prevailed. And then he goes on to give some ta- some cases. He gives one of taxes, um, but the quote that the, um, uh, the Teshuvot, the response the literature brings, is in fact uh, brought from um, the Talmud, and it says, does the fact that they are the majority give them a license to be robbers? Now, the case in the Talmud has to do more with what we would call uh, eminent domain, which is they're building a road, and it's going through someone's field, and it's in the uh, good of the majority, uh, but maybe there's a 
alternative way that could be solve the problem of taking going through this person's uh, property. And it comes up with this rule, uh, just because you have a majority need, uh, it doesn't give you permission to license us to be robbers. And based on that Talmudic dictum, in the 10th century, they began to build a law of the majority definitely has power, the power of the kihila, but you have to recognize the rights of the um, uh, individual. And what Menachem Elon is doing is what he did for the 10 odd years that he was on the Supreme Court, which is when a question came up that uh, had to be addressed, he addressed it not only from common law, but he went back to our sources and saw how we addressed it as well. He didn't bifurcate. And and I think we need more of that. And he absolutely is is a scholar that we need more scholars such as him. Don't you agree? I mean, it's so interesting you say that because Mishpati Vri now kind of is a code word for an approach to the legal system in Israel, which says that the legal system in Israel determines law not just based on secular rules, but also on religious rules. So he actually created a movement called Mishpativri. I think that's amazing, but in my reading of him, he didn't refer, and I think he says this a little bit later, when you say Jewish law, all of a sudden everybody says, okay, so now you're going to start bringing in rules of kashrut, and now you're going to start bringing in rules of forbidden relationships. When he thought of Jewish law, he thought of 2,000 years of creative legislation and um, uh, uh, peer published um, uh, um, policy statements he 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 was referring to our law uh, the law that we developed over 2000 years it didn't all walk around with a kippah on it it just meant that it was the law that was developed by the jewish people over time and i think that can be lost a little bit because everybody and i'm sure there are those that argue against um uh, 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 mishpat ivri uh for a bunch of reasons but the reason that it is quote unquote Jewish law, uh, I think, is a, it, it can be mis, misdirecting uh, because it really is uh, the law uh, corpus that the Jews developed over over time that we should not just uh, ditch, but we can benefit from because it came from a community dedicated to justice, justice shall yeah, you pursue. Right. Good. I mean, I think that point, you, thank you very much. That point is an important point. Menachem Elon, you see, the intersection between Israeli law and Jewish law is an intersection of Israeli law as part of the law that Jews have developed over the centuries. I think maybe we want to say it that way. So this is how he says it. He says, an examination of the creative devices of Jewish law in developing the existing law to respond to the needs of the time and the social climate is indeed enlightening. Such adjustments were accomplished in various ways, interpretation of existing sources, reliance on basic legal principle. Um, he, he quotes a, a beautiful verse in the Torah, which is, Darche, darche noam v'chol nativotecha shalom, that the Torah Torah's ways are pleasant, her paths are peaceful, meaning to say that's not descriptive, it's prescriptive, and that our Torah commands us to make laws that benefit all of, of the citizens. He says reliance on custom, minhag, and legislation, as well as turning to agada and legal philosophy. This last method was especially instrumental in solving many difficult legal problems. So when he says Mishpat Ivri, Jewish law, he is really looking at the widest scope of, uh, of, of Jewish law. I mean, it's amazing. As I was just about finished making the notes, I came across a tablet, a magazine article that literally came out two days ago. And it talks about an argument that, um, uh, that, 
uh, 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 Menachem Elon had with the more famous Barak. And it was over a simple law. It had to do with a law of whether the government would pay for a car for to drive a handicapped person. And it says only if the... Um, person who would drive the car uh, was not only a relative, but lived in the same house. And the article shows that Barak comes back, uh, that uh, Ilan comes back and says, that is unreasonable. He uses the unreasonable clause. And he says, because what happens if the relative doesn't uh, live in the house? Maybe he lives somewhere else. And he quotes a verse from the Midrash that talks about Sodom, where uh, they made beds that people couldn't fit into. And the point of the tablet article was that literally in that uh, uh, minority opinion, uh, uh, Ilan was uh, was demonstrating what he writes about here, that we have to bring up the richness of a Jewish lore and lore. Um, we have to go to our Midrashic sources. We also have to do what is right and fair. It just really, you know, I think what I'm trying to uh, argue for today is not for one justice's approach or another. Certainly, um, 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 Menachem alone believed in some issues that we should not have an activist court, and that's a whole other discussion. But what I am arguing for is, why, for God's sake, aren't we having this discussion, and why aren't we discussing it in the terms that we are discussing in this week's Parsha, and that the ha- takes advantage of the richness of our Jewish jurisprudence uh, and learning for 2,000 years. Yeah, I mean, that, that point is a very important point, and it comes up especially in this week's parsha because Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof. What, you know, where, what's the place of Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof in the conversations that we have today? I think that's kind of in one sentence, that's a question we have to ask. Yeah, I mean, as you as you raised, it's definitely emphatic. You know, it's like stop, stop. Um, but the commentaries, you know, clearly there are many that say it means justice with justice. You know, it's not enough to do the right thing; you have to do it in the right way. But I am going to quote what uh, Menachem uh, Elon writes about Tzedek Tzedek in the article that I quote. I mean, he really it could be uh, 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 in the galley of uh, the commentary to our part. He says, the double mention of the word justice in the biblical verse, tzedek tzedek you shall pursue, was interpreted in the Talmud as folios. One mention of justice refers to a decision based on the law, the other to compromise. Um, The Talmud continues uh, with an example. But before he gets there, if you recall, Rabbi, when we did our uh, episode on Tisha B'Av, we quoted one of the rabbis who said that the temple was destroyed because they didn't go lifnim meshurat hadin, because they left to the letter of the law. He quotes a similar um, uh, uh, authority that says that the temple was destroyed because tzedek by itself, justice, doing what the halacha says is not enough. You also have to have this element of, um, of compromise. And what he does is he brings also a story that we have quoted before of um, the two the two camels of the two boats. Uh, I'll get to uh, in a few minutes why we quoted it and in what context. But if you have uh, basically uh, uh, two camels going in opposite directions uh, in a very narrow road, uh, one has to give a right of way to the other. It's called compromise. Um, and so in, in this particular situation. The Talmud gives us some direction. It says if one is carrying a load and the other is not, the um, load, one without the load should give way. But the point that um, Menachem Elon is making is that um, it is literally this level of of compromise that is necessary for law. And you might not find this compromise, and this is, gets back to what I was saying before, written in a particular place in the Torah. But when we say Jewish law, uh, baked into it is this need for compromise. He quotes the Nitziv. And the Nitziv, uh, these are very traditional commentaries. Uh, if the law cannot bring about peace, there must be compromise. That is what taught in Tractate Sanhedrin, 
justice, justice shall you pursue. Um, the verse refers to a situation where a compromise is imposed and it is impossible to decide the case on the basis of law. Under the law, both may proceed and both will perish, or one of them will overcome the other and be saved at the other's expense. But this is not a judgment of peace. This is why there is a mandate not to apply strict law, but to force a compromise. Law that does not bring about peace is not proper and desirable law, for the very definition and essence of law is to produce judgment that resolves a dispute peacefully. Mishpat Shalom. Pursuit of justice in such a case requires the compulsion of a peaceful result by way of compromise. Since the result of insisting on legal rights is strife and contentiousness between the parties, a peaceful compromise is compelled. This is an excellent example of the application of law and justice in a way that brings peace, and the Nitziv uh, goes ahead then and references that the temple was destroyed because these um, uh, suggestions of compromise were not followed, and he finishes by saying, whenever my eyes observe a decision Dispute among the Jewish communities, a fire burns within me. Accordingly, I cannot be silent until I have spoken on the subject. So, number one, what is happening in Israel is not new. Uh, that's the good news. Um, uh, the 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 other good news is that if we look back into uh, Jewish texts. Um, um, there are guidelines for forcing compromise. Um, and maybe the signs of those who are against the uh, legal reform, uh, who are mostly secular, should start bringing up Tzedek Tzedek Tirdov and should start quoting the Nitziv to bring the other side, who seems to have forgotten all of their Jewish learning, um, back to the table to discuss these texts. Uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing isn't it? It really is amazing. And it is interesting that this really hasn't been brought up. This isn't the issue. Um, you know, on either side, they're not going back to these texts. And Menachem Melon, it's so interesting that you found this article, because Menachem Melon doesn't seem to be a factor really in Israel right now. You don't see Menachem Elon, right? In Haaretz, you don't see, they don't quote Menachem Elon as someone who needs to be someone to be considered. That's also interesting. That whole approach, that whole idea of Mishpat Ivri doesn't seem to have the same power that it once had. Well, you know, I've 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 quoted and I showed a picture of someone with a T-shirt with Yeshaya Leibovitch on, and he was against right. the settlements. So, you know, it's very easy when you select the justice to ask them what their position is on uh, uh, on abortion. Um, but of course, you always have to play the game because you're really not supposed to be asking what their position is on a particular issue. You're supposed to be getting a sense of their judicial philosophy. But we all we all are uh, weak in that regard. So it's very easy for the secular to take Ishaya Leibovitch, uh, because not only was he critical of the uh, religious, but he also uh, was critical particularly of um, the settlement and the occupation. I think Menachem Ilon um, is one, and I tried to find out what his position was on the occupation, but that was wrong of me, because really what you look for in a jurist and what you look for in a chauffette that we are required to uh, 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 a point is someone who it has this equanimity, and in this particular case, because we are a Jewish democratic state, and by the way, in one of the uh, um, uh, quotes that I have from him, he goes, you would never have this discussion anywhere else. You would never ask for, uh, in America, for someone who was uh, American democratic or Italian democratic. But the Jewish democratic part has to do with our very rich history. Uh, and it is something, maybe that's the tzedek tzedek that we have to look at. But the point is, to answer your observation, uh, I think Menachem Elon, he's not a poster child. Uh, we don't know what I don't know where he stands on all the issues, but where I look at what he has said and how he develops his arguments, and he uses both erudition in secular common law as well as Jewish law. I say we need more of that. Give me more of that, um, and um, I, I think that's what's absolutely lacking from this conversation. And while it might be a reach to say at this late stage, this is how we get out of it. 
On the other hand, um, it's what we do have in common. That's what a Jewish democratic state has. And and what he says, uh, it, it's interesting. He, I said I would get back to the story of the two camels. So we mentioned the two camels because the same piece of Talmud was discussed by the Chazon Ish and Ben Gurion. Um, and uh, this is what um, Menachem Elon says about that meeting. He says, uh, and what he says about the state of affairs uh, in Israel today. To my deep regret, the knowledge of the Jewish heritage has progressively diminished among many Jews, young and old. He could have said religious and unreligious. This disturbing phenomenon is a very significant factor in the estrangement and splits that we see today. In the early days of the State of Israel, the interesting Talmudic passage regarding the heights of Beit Charon, that's that narrow strait, was subject of a conversation between David Ben-Gurion, one of the great founders of the State of Israel, and the Chazon Ish, Rabbi Shayahu Keralitz, the leading halachic authority of the period. Of course, mention was made of the rule that the unloaded camel must give way to the camel that is carrying a load. Here is what Menachem Elon writes. Ben-Gurion and the Chazon Ish differed over which of them represented the camel carrying the load, which represents the burden of the heritage of the generation and the national vision. This is a legitimate and appropriate dispute. We should only be privileged to see the continuation of such a discussion today. Only in this way can the proper synthesis be found between the state, the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Wow. I mean, what what he's saying is that here were two Jews who were um, discussing what the essence of the state of Israel was. And that's a valid uh, argument. Um, um, But again, they were discussing a piece of Talmud, which is fascinating. And um, the the bottom line is what Menachem Ilon is saying is, isn't it sad that either there is a lack of knowledge or a lack of interest of bringing that knowledge? I think that the Study of Torah has been so monopolized. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, one thing that we do at Madlik is we say, hey, the only requirement to study Torah is an interest in studying Torah uh, and a love of studying Torah. Uh, you never ask me, I never ask you what our level of observance is, uh, what opinions we have on any subject. Uh, this is, I think, uh, and I might be dreaming here, but if, if we could uh, start um, formulating the arguments that are going on today in Israel, uh, more in Jewish terms, I think both sides would be confronted with um, uh, with issues that are not that easy uh, uh, and maybe don't come out on a, a poster or a, a bumper sticker, but it will get to having a positive discussion where we can get out of the quagmire and the narrow uh, the narrow strait of Beit Choron that we are sunk into. I mean, it couldn't be, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Celeste gave us a heart just now. I mean, I think that really is, you know, the, you know, in reintroducing Menachem Elon, introducing our listeners to Menachem Elon is, I think, a nice step in that direction. Shayo Leibowitz, um, you know, we talked about him. We need to, to broaden the discussion and see the, the conversation as a, as a part of a long conversation about what the role of law is in Jewish society, what the law of democracy and justice is in Jewish society. So thank you very much, Jeffrey. Have a great Shabbat. I will think of all of you on the West Coast, and we look forward next week to studying Kitetse with everybody. Shabbat Shalom, Nesiyat uh, Marry that couple and create another Bayat Neman in Israel. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to all of you, and let's always remember Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, that we need to pursue justice uh, all the time. Shabbat Shalom. Henry Feuerstein is coming up. Henry, take off the, unmute yourself. But, but okay, but what if you know, t- um, the, the provisions in the Shof team about judges and what they're supposed to apply is really religious law? It's supposed to be what's said in the Torah. And, and therefore, what's wrong with the right-leaning you know, position on this and that? It should be done that way and not some sort of secularized version. I'm not, uh, what I'm asking basically is why is their position any less valid than her own, than, than um, Nilone's position in general? 
And I'm not trying to advocate for no, no. obviously the, the, B, the BB administration. I'm just wondering why is that any, why is what's stated in the Torah any less valid? Well, first of all, not and not a lot is stated in the Torah that uh, relates to international relations, that relates to a whole bunch of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of other issues. There are, having a state and a modern state is one that needs uh, updated laws and updated concepts. But I think the concepts that you find in um, even Jewish law, when it says dine de malchut, normally yeah. I, would argue, I would tell you that most of the people that you're describing who want to quote-unquote, be ruled by Torah law, uh, believe that um, there's, uh, uh, there, that there's uh, uh, laws for, you know, how you, uh, two people, Shimon and Levi, deal with this and that. The, the Torah Codex always understood Dine de Malchut, legislation for a nation, was always going to be different. And it really doesn't have it. Um, it requires, that's what I, the point I was trying to make is, if you look at the Torah sources themselves from Jethro, telling Moses to set up courts to our Parsha today, it's less about content and it's more about process. That there aren't laws for all of this. What there are is a really strong commitment to courts and the rule of law. And whatever the courts decide, that is the law. So I think it's a, a misnomer for, I mean, it's easy for someone to say, I want everything to be decided by Torah law. But Torah law itself has always taken into account um, other uh, other um, uh, needs, uh, and that's what Menachem Ilon is saying. And um, he, frankly, you know, felt he was uh, literally within the tradition of uh, Jewish law. That's why he could write a two-volume set called Mishpata Ivri. And literally, mm -hmm. his knowledge of uh, of of all of the legal opinions in our history is is universal. It's it's uh, encyclopedic. So let me ask my then let me ask my second question. It relates, and that is without taking sides in the current political the you know atmosphere. What is if BB were on this call, or B, you know a, a BBist were on this call, what would he or he or she argue against her, um, Elon's position? Because they're obviously taking an opposite position, and I'm trying to understand whether or not their position is valid under. Mish, under uh, under Shoftim or under Mishpatim or under, you know under any sense of Jewish law, I'm trying to understand if the, if you know I I I got the compromise concept I mean, that's clear, but I'm not so sure that that's a necessity that somebody has to do or has to practice. So you know I can't get into Bibi's head, and I'm not sure I would ever want to. But I'm joking. But 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 let me just say this: I've heard Bibi interviewed a number of times. And where he goes is the Federalist Papers. And he says, I know the Federalist Papers better than anybody else. My point is that um, if you had this discussion and CNN and uh, 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 t talking to Wolf Blitzer is not the place to have it. All I'm arguing for is that no one is even consulting with our tradition. Um, and least of all, the uh, uh, parties in power who are more interested in manipulating uh, what they see as a non-Jewish secular court. And I am arguing that it's not a non-Jewish secular court. It's the it's Dine de Malchut. It is the court uh, of Israel uh, in terms of representing the population. It is following the Pasuk says that you have to appoint judges to adjudicate in your uh, settlements. Otherwise, you will not stay in the land. And it doesn't focus on what law they refer to because law is always changing. No one, no legal structure could survive if you had to uh, go back to the original uh, text. But our texts have never been accused of doing that. Uh, the texts that I quoted are all much more in terms of process and framework and orientation than they are in particulars. Sure, and I'm not, I'm not a supporter of the BB side of the whole process, but I just don't understand why they're not right, the same way that the opposition is correct. So I, I can only, look, today is a very, uh, f a very small element of the conversation, but I would say that from the, from the a perspective of 2,000 years of Jewish law, their arguments are um, non-Jewish. 
Uh, when they argue that we were elected uh, by a popular vote and then we can make changes in how the justices are uh, picked, I will say to them in my best uh, Hebrew, shamezach. You should be ashamed of yourself because that is not what all the commentaries that we were looking at today were talking about. There are specific rules as to how you uh, elect judges. Uh, I mean, there are even some that say that they have to be wealthy enough that they don't have to do menial labor so that they won't be likely to fall into uh, accepting bribes. There's a rich tradition of putting judges together. There's a rich tradition of saying uh, how much power does the majority have. And they're not referring to that. They're all talking about democratia. And I am just saying that, uh, but I can't say this so much to the um, secular, but to the religious parties, Shemzach, you should be embarrassed. And of course, what mm-hmm. they will say is, between you and me, Jeffrey, this state, it's not a Jewish state anyway. We just happen to live here. We're trying to get the best deal for us. And I will tell them, Shemzach on that too. <laughs> <laughs> Even more so. <laughs> Absolutely. Henry, okay. love you. Thanks for joining today, and see you next week. You got it, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, all the best.